being with you last Sunday, um, I was actually being a father uh, down in I couldn't have preached anyway, I screamed so loud. Uh, our Vail Christian High School dance team uh, took first place in stage for a record fifth time. And uh, blood sport, you can imagine hundreds of high school girls in this Denver Coliseum uh, for a very long day. Uh, it was a lot of emotion, and, uh, and they just did great. But it was late. They didn't start the awards until 10, 15 at night. And, um, and the awards went on like half as long as the competition. Um, and Rachel was awarded uh, this uh, All-State Leadership in Dance, which we were particularly proud of. So, uh, so yeah. Mark was preaching, and now I have this week, and uh, I have to tell you one of my all-time favorite sermons, this one, really, really good, um, and I so enjoy this moment before we plunge into uh, Christmas week. I enjoy it because we shift in the readings from John the Baptist to Mary. I grew up in a church called St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Tampa, Florida. I looked at Mary literally in stained glass every single Sunday. So, uh, if you think that women don't get their due in Scripture, may I tell you that we don't end Advent with John, we end Advent with Mary. And Mary says today, I, I found this image of a beautiful book of hours in the front of your bulletin. I love finding these pictures. Uh, Magnificat in Latin. I don't think Mary actually spoke Latin, but don't tell the Roman Catholics that. Uh, she actually says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And so I've come to ask, what's your soul doing with the Lord? This 15 or 16 year old young Jewish woman was able to say, my soul magnifies God's presence. And she challenges us today to ask about what our soul is doing I was at a party last night. I love Christmas parties. I should bring this stole to every party I attend because I hear confessions, basically, at this time of the year. It's very compressed, and I, it's cool to let me drink wine to do it. It's kind of awesome. And um, I, I was visiting a Christmas party, and you know Christmas party talk. How are you? How's your year been? And can we summarize my complex life in about 10 seconds? And I went to, uh, I was visiting with a woman I've known for years, and I said, you look so beautiful. And she said, I'm due on the outside, but not on the inside. Whoa, hold on, where's my stole? <laughs> and then we proceeded to have a very honest conversation for a Christmas party. Uh, in the collect, the prayer that we open the worship with today, is a singular distinction for Anglicans, for Episcopal Christians, that we start with a prayer that focuses us on the theme for the day. This is one of my all-time favorite collects. I pray it all the time. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation that your Son, Jesus Christ, at His coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for Himself. This is one of the brilliant moments of the Book of Common Prayer amongst many, when uh, the author of that collect takes a scriptural picture of heaven and upends it. All through the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, there is a consistent picture of heaven, right? Heaven's a place where there's a banquet. Heaven's on a mountain top, right? This is where Baal comes in. Uh, heaven's a place where there's a beautiful mansion, and God's prepared a place, a, a special place for each one of us. And this is a picture that the people of the Bible could understand. That, you know, heaven was a safe place, a beautiful mansion, a place where they could live uh, without threat. Except, in today's prayer, the mansion is not somewhere out there in heaven. The mansion is here, inside of us. Purify our conscience by your daily visitation, 
that your son Jesus at his coming may find in us a mansion. Where is Jesus to be born this Christmas? The college is clear. It's not in Bethlehem. Not now. It's right here. And so this is why I love the sermon. We get to go on a little house tour this morning. And it's a tour of our spiritual mansions. Are you ready? How's your house looking for Christmas? Let's go in our spiritual mansion to the very first place. Before you even go in the house, what's the first thing you see? <coughs> pardon, pardon me, those of you that have heard this sermon eight times. A door. You have to walk in through a door, right? Okay, here are the amazing things about doors. There's only two ways a door goes. A door is either wide or it's totally closed. Right, okay. How's your door? I met someone at this party last night that had every blessing of every advantage, every provision, every material thing they wanted for nothing, and that door was not only closed tight, it was bolted and it was soldered shut. So I'm sitting there thinking, how in the world can you complain when you've been given all of this and the riches literally of the world are all around you, you want for nothing, and yet you were so shut up that God can stand right next to you. You never even see Him. I mean, some people go through the holidays. It's amazing to me. And their spiritual door is slammed shut. Nothing's going to get into me. I've got this thing locked down. And then they're utterly surprised at how desolate and how devastating this time of year. May I suggest that our spiritual mansion to be prepared for Jesus, the best way is to open the door fairly wide to have us available and open to something new and different. You know that old picture of Jesus knocking on the door with the lantern, you know? And of course there's no handle on the outside of the door. Where's the handle? Right? Who's the person that can open the door? You. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Jesus, well, he can kick a door down. That's a little traumatic, don't you think? It does happen, but I don't like that. That's a tough way to go. May I suggest that a spiritual door in our mansion is wide open to say, yes, Lord, what's new and different for this Christmas? There might be a Jesus that comes walking in that you've never met before, but only if that door is open. Let's go into the living room. I've gone into living rooms. I love going to your houses because I get to learn who you are when I come into your house. Have you ever been in a house where every other room is really well used and the living room looks like a mausoleum? There's dust on everything. You're afraid to like sit in the couch because you might offend the, the people that own the house. Have you ever been in seeing a living room like that? And it's like, it's just never visited. What's a living room for? I know we have architects here, and we have designers here. What's a living room for? The name is going to kind of give you the hint. <laughs> living. What are you supposed to do in a living room? Is hang out with people that you love, right? And sit and, and enjoy their company. Put your feet up. Have a cup of tea. Oh, I'm sorry, if you're Episcopalian, have something stronger. <laughs> Spend some time with the people that you love. Invite people that you care about into that room. This is a time of year to be with people that you love. Right? I mean, sometimes I can go through this entire season. I blow past the living room and I never actually spend time with the people that are most important to me. And it's so stupid. Why in the world would I miss the people that are right next to me, that I really care about? I sat with uh, people last night, and I, all through the season they tell me that one of the places that they find family is in our church. This is one of the reasons they come to the Vail Valley. 
So guess who their family is while they're here? You. And they're not joking around. Some of them prefer you to their own family. And you know, that's a close vote for me sometimes, myself. Who are the people that you want to live with? Who are the people that you enjoy living with in a vital and beautiful relationship? Who are the people that you want in your living room? And why not live with them at a time like this? Why not value the people that we're supposed to and enjoy their company? Do you know that we have people in the hospital right now and the number one thing they tell me is if they could cut their right arm off to spend five minutes with the people that they love, they would do it. Why does it take a diagnosis to teach us how valuable the people that are right next to us really are? Friends, how's the living room? Is it filled with life and the people that you want to be with? Let's go into the kitchen. This is great. When you invite me to your house, I will go into your kitchen. Your kitchen and pantries tell me all I need to know about you. Is it the kitchen where the woman's TV is over here and the man's TV is six feet away? I mean, that tells me something about you, right? Uh, is it a kitchen where the wine cellar is about 18 times as large as the pantry? There's another subtle message there. Uh, it, it is, it, you know, is it a kitchen where you have the huge refrigerator? I mean, you know, what's it like in the kitchen? And the reason I ask that is because in our spiritual mansions, that's where the nourishment comes from. That's where our souls are fed. Now, I want to tell you that some people will actually ship. I mean, I know deacons, for instance, that get food shipped from other states because they want the right ingredients. If you start well in food, generally don't you end well? And at this time of year, it's so interesting to me that people will eat the things that are the worst for them, and they know they're going to do it. Why am I saying the confession with you today in just a few minutes? At this party last night, on the table, is the one thing that I should not eat. I pay doctors to tell me what not to eat. What did I do last night? You go straight to the one thing that's the worst for you, and you go, oh yeah, <laughs> this is sin, and it's awesome. You know? But at this time of the year, isn't it important to be nourished with the right kind of food? And there's so many people that will be pulled away by the worst spiritual nourishment that you can imagine. And you know what? If you start with bad things in the kitchen, you're going to end up with bad. God wants to feed us the best spiritual food. God can put together the same Christmas all the ingredients into something new and different, and you can eat and feast spiritually. I mean soul food. That's what the kitchen of our mansion is for. It's for God to nourish us from the deepest parts of His grace. Don't miss that meal at Christmas. Please don't miss Jesus wanting to feed us with something new and beautiful and different. Let's go to the room that everybody gets a little fidgety when I preach this sermon. It's the bedroom. How's the spiritual bedroom? You know, the bedroom is the place where some of the most awesome things in the world can happen. Some of the highest joys are in that bedroom. And the longer I've lived, the more I know that some of the deepest pain is also in that bedroom. This is not the living room for family and friends. This is for the person that we're intimate with, very close. And I know that Christmas can be a time when this can be a very painful kind of thing. May I suggest that Jesus can actually visit the bedroom. This is the one moment when three is not a crowd. This is a place where God can bring tremendous healing. I, I, I find it fascinating.
that some people have lived in this bedroom their entire lives and they've never actually prayed together in that room. You want an awesome Christmas? May I make a suggestion? So how about a prayer in that room? How about a sense of forgiveness that Jesus says, you know, joy can really wipe away a lot of hurt. And if there's hurt in that space, in that most intimate place, maybe God can bring a little bit of joy. If you're married, if you're single, if you're widowed, if you're divorced, and this is for everybody. That intimate space. Well, what would happen if Jesus just came strolling in? There's forgiveness there. There can be a different feeling there. And a gift of joy. Let's end with the last room. The last room. Anybody remember this part of the sermon? Where is the place where you dump all the stuff that you don't want anybody to see? This is the room that takes it for the team. We're, we're having a party. My wife is working on a Guardian Scholars party tonight. And we were unloading supplies at the host's house yesterday. And I look up into a beautiful study with wood panel bookshelves and a fireplace. It's awesome. And I said to our host, what a beautiful room. He said, well, that used to be my study, but now that's where we dump everything. Where's your dump room in this spiritual mansion? We all have it. It's where we jam all that stuff in. We don't know what to do with it. We're anxious about it. We're terrified of it. We're hurt by it. And we're going to throw it in there. And eight years later, we're going to figure out what to do with it. Can I give you a promise? Those boxes of photographs will never organize themselves if you don't touch them. It's so weird. Year after year, they're going to be right where you left them. It's so odd. Someone's got to go into that room. You know Radical Extreme Makeover, that show? They film these poor people that can't do this, and the guy comes out, oh, I'll do it. Well, sure you can. Let's look at your house. Some of us need help in that room. Has Jesus ever looked at that room? Have you ever said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do with this. I got nothing. It's stacking up in there. I know it's there, and I really don't know how to handle it. Is there maybe this Christmas a space for Jesus to come do radical extreme makeover? You know, Jesus with a chainsaw going through that room, we can take care of this. We can redo this together. You know, there's some of us need a chainsaw in that room. Others, maybe a little bit of pain. How about a little shine? How about a little organization? There's generally a space where Jesus really needs to visit for all of us. Why not let him in to that? Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation. That your Son, Jesus Christ, in his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Just before Christmas, what's our soul saying to the Lord today? In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.